What is up, people? Welcome back. We're going to go over Unit 5 and learn about the long-run consequences of stabilization policies. So let's get right to it. And do me a favor and smash that like button and subscribe while the music plays. Hey, just a quick reminder that if you click the link in the description, you can get the notes for this video. Okay, so I know that the name of this unit mentions the long run, but we're actually going to start in the short run. In Unit 3, we did Fiscal Policy, Unit 4, we did Monetary Policy, but now we're going to consider Fiscal and Monetary Policy together because, realistically, both types of policies happen simultaneously. So let's start with what's similar. Expansionary Fiscal Policy and Expansionary Monetary Policy both have the same purpose to increase output and reduce unemployment. So they should both be used when there is a recessionary or negative output gap. And they both affect the ADAS model the same way, by shifting the AD curve to the right, closing the negative output gap, and bringing the economy back to potential output and the natural rate of unemployment. It's the same thing with contractionary policy, but in reverse. Contractionary fiscal policy and contractionary monetary policy can be used to bring down the inflation rate and therefore used when there's an inflationary gap. Each policy shifts the AD curve left, bringing the economy again back to long-run equilibrium. Okay, so both policies are used similarly, and they affect AD, price level, and output similarly. But it turns out that the policies affect interest rates differently. Let's run through this quickly, starting with monetary policy. Okay, so we know that expansion monetary policy shifts the MS curve right, lowering the nominal interest rate, and that's what leads to the increase in consumer and investment spending that shifts the AD curve to the right on the ADAS model. Let's keep these two models up and do it again with expansionary fiscal policy, though. This one starts with the AD curve shifting right, leading to a higher price level and increased output. On the money market model, this affects the MD curve by shifting it to the right. Because the price level has risen, people demand more money. This MD curve shift raises the nominal interest rate. So here's the takeaway. Expansionary policies move interest rates in opposite directions. So if policymakers want to increase output without having much effect on interest rates, they should make both policies expansionary. Here's a table with the various combinations of policies and how they affect our main variables. You'll notice that when it's the same type of policy, the impact on AD, Y, and P is clear, but what's unclear is what happens to interest rates and bond prices. When the two policies are mixed, it's unclear what happens to AD, Y, and P, but clear what happens to interest rates and bond prices. Okay, so next up is the Phillips curve, and good news, it's the only new model in this unit, and it's basically just a rebranding of the ADAS model. So let's go. On the Phillips curve, the y-axis is the inflation rate and the x-axis is the unemployment rate. And the short-run Phillips curve, or SRPC, is downward sloping. This shows us that there's a trade-off between inflation and unemployment in the short run. At point A, there's a low unemployment rate, but a higher inflation rate. And if we move down to point B, we can see that unemployment has risen while inflation has fallen. On the other hand, the long-run Phillips curve, or LRPC, is vertical, showing that there is not a trade-off between inflation and unemployment in the long run. Here, a higher inflation rate causes no reduction in the unemployment rate. Let's talk about the placement of the LRPC. It's located at the natural rate of unemployment, which you know means that there's no cyclical unemployment and that the economy is in long-run equilibrium. It also means that when the economy is on its LRPC, it's also on the LRAS curve of the ADS model. So if we're anywhere to the left of the LRPC, the economy is in an inflationary gap, while anywhere to the right of the LRPC, it's in a recessionary gap, basically the mirror image of the ADAS model. At the intersection of the SRPC and the LRPC, the actual inflation rate is equal to the expected inflation rate. If we're anywhere to the left of the LRPC, it means that actual inflation is higher than expected inflation. For example, at point A, inflation is 6%, while people only expected 4%. Anywhere to the right of the LRPC, actual inflation is lower than expected inflation. Now, it's obvious when the numbers are there, but even if I took those numbers away, you'd still need to know the truth of those statements. This will become super important in just a moment when we go from the short run to the long run. But before we do that, let's talk about movements and shifts of the SRPC. We'll do movements first, and I actually have good news. It's pretty simple. Anything that shifts the AD curve to the right also causes an upward movement along the SRPC. Notice what happens when the AD curve shifts right. We get increased output and prices. The increased output tells us that unemployment has fallen. When we move up along our SRPC, guess what we see? 
increased inflation, and lower unemployment. Again, these models are showing us the exact same information. So the beautiful thing for us here is that if you're already comfortable with your AD shifters, it means that you know everything that will cause an upward movement along the SRPC. By the way, please be aware that it's not the AD curve shifting that causes our SRPC movements. Rather, it's the changes in C, I, G, or X, N that are causing both the AD shift and the SRPC movement. This also means that when policymakers use fiscal and monetary policy, that it'll cause movements along the SRPC. A downward movement of the SRPC corresponds to the AD curve shifting left. Okay, so here at point B, the economy is in an inflationary gap, perhaps because of expansionary policy implemented by policymakers, and actual output is greater than potential, and unemployment is below the natural rate. On the ADAS model, we talk about how sticky wages make this possible, and that's true here too, but on this model, we typically use inflationary expectations to explain this. At point B, actual inflation is higher than expected inflation. Eventually, people, including workers and firms, will expect higher inflation, and in turn, nominal wages will rise, shifting the SRAS left. On the Phillips curve, we say that inflationary expectations shift the SRPC. An increase in inflationary expectations shifts the SRPC right. And we arrive at point C, back in longer in equilibrium, where actual inflation equals expected inflation. See? Just like the ADAS model. And this shows us what shifts the SRPC. Shifts of the SRPC are caused by the same things that shift the SRAS curve. You do need to be a little careful because the shifts are in opposite directions. So like we just saw, when the SRAS shifts left, it's the same as the SRPC shifting right. And you'd be correct to assume that the SRAS shifting right is the same as the SRPC shifting left. We're thinking of things like inflationary expectations, nominal wages, inputs, productivity, and government policies toward businesses. Lastly, a couple more things about the LRPC. The LRPC is also known as the NERU, or the Non-Accelerating Inflation Rate of Unemployment. It's a mouthful, but it's a way to say that when we're on the LRPC, since actual inflation equals expected inflation, as long as policymakers don't do anything else, inflation will stay right where it is. It's a good reminder that attempts to keep unemployment below the natural rate will only lead to accelerating levels of inflation. And you likely won't have to draw this, but you'll probably be asked about shifts of the LRPC. The only thing that shifts the LRPC is if the natural rate of unemployment changes, and please remember that the natural rate doesn't change from business cycle fluctuations, but rather from things like an aging population or changes in policies like minimum wage and unemployment benefits that alters people's participation in the labor force. Okay, so now we're gonna discuss inflation and finally answer the question of what actually causes inflation. Turns out it's actually simple. Inflation occurs when the money supply increases faster than output. The economy produces so much stuff and we have so many dollars. Prices come from that ratio of the amount of stuff we have to the amount of dollars. Imagine the amount of stuff we produce stays the same from one year to the next, but the amount of dollars we have increased. Guess what? Prices are going to go up. There are now more dollars chasing the same number of goods, and so prices are going to get bid up. And we have inflation. And we can use this opportunity to introduce the term monetary neutrality, which describes something we've already talked about, but without using that specific term. Changes in the money supply have no effect on real output in the long run. Or said another way, changes in the money supply affect only nominal variables, not real variables like output in the long run. We can see this on the ADAS model with an economy at full employment. Suppose expansionary policy is used, AD shifts to the right, and in the short run we see the outcome, higher output, and lower unemployment. In the long run though, we know it's going to happen. Nominal wages and inflationary expectations increase, shifting the SRAS to the left. And when we compare E1 and E3, what do we find? The only change is a higher price level, no longer an effect on output and unemployment. Again, we come back to the statement that in the long run, the growth rate of the money supply determines the growth of the price level or inflation. This time, let's go into this a little bit deeper. This section is all based on the quantity theory of money, which emphasizes the positive relationship between the price level and the money supply, especially in the long run. We'll use the velocity equation to demonstrate this. M times V equals P times Y. M is for money supply, V represents the velocity of money, P is the price level, and we know that Y is real GDP. Velocity of money is the only new concept here, and it refers to the number of times the average dollar bill is spent per year. I just want to remind you of a related equation back from unit two. P times Y equals N, where N is nominal GDP. In other words, the price level times real output gives us nominal GDP. 
And because, hooray math, that means that m times v also equals nominal GDP. So the money supply times the number of times the average dollar bill is spent equals nominal GDP. And this actually makes sense because nominal GDP just means total spending. So the amount of money multiplied by how many times that money gets spent equals total spending. Now, remember the claim is that growth of the money supply determines the growth of the price level. We're going to make an important assumption that the velocity of money is stable, which means that an increase in M leads to a proportional increase in nominal GDP. And we know that changes in the money supply don't affect real GDP in the long run. So we're left with the fact that an increase in the money supply lead directly to a proportional increase in the price level. Here's an example. If V is constant, a 10% increase in M leads to a 10% increase in N. And since the change in money supply only affects nominal variables, this means the entire 10% increase in N is the result of a 10% increase in P. All right, not bad at all. So now we're turning our attention to another long run consequence of fiscal policy. One that's near and dear to my heart, government deficits and the national debt. Okay, well, the budget balance is the difference between tax revenue and government spending and transfers. When tax revenue exceeds government spending and transfers, the federal government has a budget surplus. And when we return from fantasy land and tax revenue is less than government spending and transfers, the government has a budget deficit. A budget deficit can also be called a negative budget balance, and a surplus is a positive budget balance. One of our important takeaways here is that expansionary fiscal policy moves the economy towards a budget deficit, meaning that it either makes a deficit larger or a surplus smaller. Since expansionary fiscal policy involves some combination of lower taxes and increased spending or transfers, it's going to move the budget balance towards a deficit. Just understand that this is a cost or trade-off of running expansionary fiscal policy. When the government runs deficits, it adds to the national debt, which refers to the total debt accumulated by the federal government. Be very careful not to mix up debt and deficit. Deficit is the yearly difference between taxes and spending, while debt is the total amount owed. But a crippling national debt isn't the only cost of expansionary fiscal policy. Next, we're going to consider crowding out. Okay, so let's assume that policymakers decide to implement expansionary fiscal policy, so they cut taxes or raise spending, or probably both. Either way, as we just established, this most likely creates a bigger budget deficit. When the government has a budget deficit, the Treasury borrows money by selling Treasury bonds. So we need to turn to our loanable funds model to see what happens next. The supply curve represents national savings, which includes both public and private savings. Public savings is another way to say the budget balance. When the federal government runs a budget deficit, public savings are negative. Therefore, a budget deficit shifts the supply curve to the left. The important thing is that this results in a higher real interest rate and in turn crowding out. Crowding out refers to the fact that the increased borrowing by the federal government pushed up the real interest rate, crowding out private investment spending that would have taken place at the lower interest rate. In fact, any interest-sensitive spending will decrease in this case, including both consumer and investment spending. Think of mortgage rates. When mortgage rates are lower, people can afford a bigger, more expensive house than they can when rates rise. And in fact, some people will choose not to buy a house at all when rates rise. We primarily focus on how investment spending is affected, though. So when interest rates are forced higher as a result of increased government borrowing, some private investment spending that would have taken place is now crowded out and doesn't take place. As a result, crowding out makes expansionary fiscal policy less effective than it would otherwise be. The goal of the policy is to shift AD to the right. But since investment spending decreases, the crowding out causes a smaller than intended shift of the AD curve. In fact, depending on how sensitive households are to the higher real interest rates, it's possible that the crowding out could offset the entire increase in AD. Another consequence takes shape if we focus specifically on the reduction in investment spending. We know that investment spending is the purchase of new physical capital, including machines, tools, technology, new construction, and that investment spending is a primary cause of economic growth. The increase in physical capital causes workers to become more productive and in turn the economy grows. If crowding out causes a decrease in investment spending, we could potentially see a lower rate of capital accumulation, and in turn, less economic growth as a result. And speaking of economic growth, let's talk about that a little bit more. We've spent a lot of time talking about policymakers and their ability to influence the economy, but ultimately, economic growth is a direct result of increases in capital. 
For now, though, let's start by defining what we mean when we say economic growth. Economic growth can be measured as the growth rate in real GDP per capita over time. Real GDP per capita is the real GDP divided by a population, and then we just observe how that number increases over time, and that's a country's growth rate. So the all-important question is, what causes economic growth? It basically all comes down to one thing, productivity. And we can formally define productivity as output per worker. And workers become more productive primarily in two ways, increases in technology and capital. The aggregate production function shows the relationship between real output and capital per worker. And you can see that it's upward sloping, indicating a positive or direct relationship between output and the amount of capital each worker has access to. Capital per worker is one of those beautifully self-defining terms, but we're talking about the amount of physical capital, tools, machines, technology that each worker has access to. And I think that makes sense, right? Workers who have access to better tools and technology will be more productive than workers who don't have access to the same things that they do. Those of you who already took micro probably noticed that this graph shows us diminishing marginal returns when it comes to capital per worker. And this makes sense. There is a tremendous leap in productivity when a farmer goes from using hand tools to an old-fashioned rickety tractor. And it's true that they'll be even more productive when they use better and better tractors, but the increase in productivity isn't as dramatic as it was from that first jump from the hand tools to the tractor. By the way, we could also draw the aggregate production function and label the x-axis human capital per worker, and so that would also work. Productivity also increases as a result of improvements in education, training, and the skills of workers. And as we just discussed, investment spending is the single biggest factor in increasing the amount of physical capital we have. So we can go straight from investment spending to economic growth. This progression is one of the most important things we learned this year. Investment spending increases the capital stock, which increases the amount of capital per worker, increasing productivity, and economic growth occurs as a result. We can see economic growth on our models in two ways, and we've already learned both of them earlier this year. An outward shift of the PPC indicates that we've had economic growth, and that our economy is now capable of producing more output. And on the ADS model, the LRAS curve shifting right indicates that economic growth has taken place. All right, and last up, we want to consider how public policy can affect economic growth for better or worse. One of the primary roles of governments in promoting economic growth is in policies that assist people in building their human capital or the education, skills, and training of workers. Many governments choose to do this by providing public education and subsidizing college education in order to increase human capital and in turn promote economic growth. Public policy can also ensure that a strong infrastructure is in place. This includes things like good roads, bridges, electric grids, sewage, and dams. A pivotal role of governments is to provide political stability and to protect property rights, and this lays the groundwork for economic growth. Additionally, policies that promote free trade and avoid excessive government intervention are likely to aid in economic growth as well. Supply-side fiscal policies that include things like reducing business taxes and providing investment tax credits can affect economic growth as well by influencing the incentives of households and businesses, encouraging them to undertake more investment spending, which, as we laid out at the beginning of this lesson, is really the first step in the process of economic growth. These policies have both short and long-run effects in the economy. In the short run, the AD curve shifts to the right as firms engage in the investment spending. But in the long run, that investment spending has created new physical capital and technology, which increases productivity and shifts our AS curves to the right, indicating that economic growth has taken place. All right, well, that's Unit 5. I'm so glad you stuck around till the end. Until next time, this has been a La Money Production. Thanks again for watching. If you haven't already, do me a favor and smash that like button and subscribe. And be sure to check out the review book, AP Macro in 250 Words. The link is in the description. It's awesome. Trust me. And I will see you in Unit 6.